All right, good morning guests and our wonderful presenters. My name is Tracy Kwan. I'm a Portland Chinatown Museum board member and I'll be assisting with the presentations today. On behalf of the Portland Chinatown Museum, I'd love to welcome you back to Hidden Histories. We start today with our land acknowledgement. The Portland Chinatown Museum acknowledges and honors the indigenous peoples and their descendants of the Lower Columbia and Willamette River region, whose lands the city of Portland and our museum currently occupy. These include Willamette, Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Molala, Multnomah, and Watlala Chinook tribes, and the Tualatin Kalapuya, who are today part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, and the many other Chinookan peoples whose established communities along the Lower Columbia uh, descendants are today members of the Grand Ronde, Warm Springs, and the Silets Confederated Tribes of Oregon. This program is a part of the Hidden Histories, Oregon's Early Chinatowns and Chinese Worker Settlements series, organized and moderated by the Portland Chinatown Museum in partnership with museums, state parks, and forests, city governments, and other educational institutional organizations across Oregon. Hidden Histories aims to provide a better understanding of Chinese immigrant history and culture and its importance to Oregon's growing Asian American population. We do so by sharing stories, archives, material culture, and histories of Oregon's early rural and urban Chinese communities. This series was made possible in part by a grant from the Oregon Humanities, a statewide nonprofit organization, and an independent affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which funds Oregon Humanities grants programs. For 50 years, Oregon Humanities has offered programs and publications that help Oregonians connect, reflect, and learn from one another. I will be your technology person for the day. So I'll be monitoring the chat function. The chat will also allow you to ask any questions regarding technology, but we ask that you use the Q&A button, which is also below in the Zoom, if you have any questions for our presenters. As time allows, we will uh, consolidate those questions and make sure that Don, Bennett, and Chu Mei have a, a moment to address them if, uh, if we have that time. I will hand it over now to Jackie Peterson Loomis, who was our founding executive director of the Portland Chantel Museum. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, welcome everybody again. Uh, my name is Jackie Peterson Loomis and I'm the Hidden History Series project director and moderator today. This month's program takes us to John Day, Oregon and its early Chinatown focusing on Kem Wa Chung and the practice of Chinese religion. Joining me today, uh, our Ken Wai Chung Museum curator, Don Merritt, and Drs. Choi Mei Ho and Dr. Bennett Bronson. Don Merritt, curator for the Ken Wai Chung State Heritage Site, will open the program today with a virtual tour of the museum. Originally established as a trading post in the 1870s, Ken Wai Chung and Company was purchased by immigrants Lung An and Ng Dok Hay in 1888, who used the building as a Chinese medical clinic, general store, community center, and residence until 1940. Following Don, scholars Choi Mei Ho and Bennett Bronson will give us a fascinating history of John Day's Chinatown, two Taoist temples, whose last remaining shrine is now housed at Kam Wa Chung and is dedicated to Sui Jing Bo, the pacifying duke, a deified mortal who once lived in Toi San County, Guangdong province, west of Hong Kong. Time permitting, there will be a short Q&A uh, following this program. Now let me introduce to you our, our speakers. First of all, Don Merritt is an archeologist and museum curator who graduated from the University of Montana in 2010 with a master's degree in archeology. span After graduation, he worked for cultural resource management firms, state and federal agencies throughout the West as an archeologist, including a position with Utah State Parks as the archeologist and museum curator for Fremont Indian State Park. Since January 2017, Don has served as a museum curator for Oregon Parks and Recreation Department's Kam Wa Chung State Heritage Site. During his tenure as an archaeologist, he surveyed and documented for listing a segment of the California Mormon Pawnee Express Trail in Utah, one of the most complete and intact segments in the state. 
He also surveyed and recorded portions of the Rosebud Battlefield near the Little Bighorn in Montana. And he now serves as the steward for the most unique historic Chinese collection in North America at Kamwa Chung. Following Don will be Dr. Bennett and, and, and Choi Mei Ho. Dr. Bennett Bronson received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1976. He was curator of Asian archaeology and ethnology at Chicago's Field Music from 1971 to 2008. He's done archaeological work in Guatemala, Thailand, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. Among his many publications with Choi Mei Ho are Splendors of the Forbidden City, Coming Home in Gold Brocade, Chinese in Early Northwest America, and Three Chinese Temples in California, as well as a number of articles on the history of American Chinese. Dr. Choi Mei Ho was born in Hong Kong. She received her PhD in art history and archaeology from the University of London in 1984. She came to the U.S. in 1987 and was an adjunct curator at the Field Museum from 1989 to 2008. In 2001, she became a founder and first president of the Chinese American Museum of Chicago, where she helped produce Chinatown in Chicago, a visitor's guide, Chinese in Chicago, 1870 to 1945, and growing up in Chicago's Chinatown, the stories of Raymond Lee. Then in 2008, she founded the Chinese and Northwest American Research Committee, CINAR, is the acronym, with Bennett Bronson. All right, let's get going. Uh, we are looking forward to Don's presentation for some time. Uh, so Don, you're on, and afterwards we'll move right on to, uh, to Troy May and, and Bennett. All right, I'll go ahead and get the screen share on here. All right, everyone see that? We see it. Okay. So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, like they said, I'm Don. I'm the museum curator here for um, <laughs> Helen Chung State Heritage Site. And today we're going to be doing a virtual tour of the historic Kenwa Chung building here in John Day, Oregon. To kind of give you a brief background, because a lot of uh, your pre previous presentations talked a little bit about that. So in 1862, uh, that's when gold was discovered here in um, Canyon Sea, just south of John Day, a couple miles. And it was for miners and laborers on their way from California and Nevada to Idaho and Montana, camped on Canyon Creek, accidentally found gold, and formed a town. Well, right with them and behind them was some Chinese laborers and miners, basically did the same thing. Camped on the creek, found gold, formed a Chinatown. In 1865, that's when this building right here, uh, Kemba Chung and Company, uh, the building was constructed, we think, by the Dolls Military Road Company around 1865 to 1866. We do not know if it was ever built by the Chinese, but the building was in existence at that point. In 1871, some Chinese laborers um, actually used it as a general store and named it Kemba Chung and Company. And that's still the original sign up there on the wall today. In 1885, a couple things happened that year. First off, the Chinatown that was in Canyon City mysteriously burnt down and the Chinese were not allowed to rebuild there. Instead, they were forced to come over here uh, to John Day where there was already a small Chinese population um, uh, living here at the time, and they actually formed a Chinatown, which they called Tiger Town. And to give you an idea how large it was, the southern extent of Chinatown was basically where this green fence is uh, to the south, extended east to the street. Over here, that was right about where these buildings and the western extent is right here behind the building in the city park. In 1885, there have been as many anywhere from 900 to 2,000 Chinese immigrants uh, calling the John Day Chinatown their home. Most of the Chinese laborers are actually living on camps, but they uh, claimed uh, Kamala Chung as their place of residence. Also during that same year is when we think Wang An and Ng Da Ke first met. Wang An, he was a businessman. 
and he was an entrepreneur here at Kamwa Chung, and he worked uh, with uh, Doc K. We'll get back to that. And this is Ng Dot K. About the time we think uh, before he arrived here to John Day, um, as you can see, his eyes are a little bit not normal, and that's where we think part of his blindness was coming from. And this is what Dot K and Langan together with one of their patients, Maybell, who is uh, right here in between them. They were very good friends. So uh, when uh, Dake and Langan first met in 1885, like I said, they started, they wanted to go into business together and they ended up purchasing Kamwa Chung and Company about 1888. And that's really when their story here begins. By 1910, most of the Chinese population had left. All the labor jobs from ranching, railroad and mining were pretty much gone. So a lot of the Chinese either went back to Portland or even back to China at that point. By the 1930s, most of Chinatown itself was gone. Fire came through, burnt down a few of the structures, including the Chinese temple, which Ben and Chai Mei will be presenting on here uh, shortly. And the temple uh, was right, right about where these bike racks are right here by the blue uh, pool building. It kind of gives you an idea about where the temple was in relation to Kamo Chong. Also in 1930s, that's when the John Day dredge looking for gold on the river pretty much buried the rest of Chinatown underneath all the tailing piles, uh, almost up to the building here. Um, basically right where the houses are on the north side is where the extent of their dredging took place. In 1940, Langan ended up passing away. He left everything to Doc Hay. In 1948, Doc K was living here in the building um, by himself at that point, he fell, broke his hip, had to be taken to Portland to be mended. He thought he'd be back in a few weeks. So he just locked the doors, locked the windows, never came back. And so um, the building was just basically locked up um, and not open for the next 20 plus years until about 1968. At that point, the city of John Day was going to develop the area and tear the building down. But one of the city council members, by the person name of Gordon Glass, he said, well, maybe before we tear the building down, we should see what's inside of it first. So they came through, unlocked the door, opened it, and they saw something that uh, they did not expect. So at this point, we'll head inside the building here. And this is what it, they found when they first opened the building in 1968. Just a little caveat, um, we um, are one of the first state parks uh, to actually have virtual reality and there is other state parks that will be um, participating in about this. We will be having a public version so everyone can view this. Um, that will be released sometime later this year, hopefully by uh, mid to late fall. So what you're standing in right now is the main room of Camo Chung. We would have walked through this little door right here. As you can see, um, it has a pretty substantial bar on it, probably the, one of the best locks in John Day uh, for security reasons. The only thing this picture does not show is that when you first enter the door, um, the outside is actually covered with uh, flattened kerosene cans. They flattened those out, put it on the doors and windows to help her protect them. And it wasn't necessarily from bullets, which there is a bullet hole, if you see right here in the center of the circle. Um, but what the main concern was people throwing flammable objects to burn the buildings down. So they put tin in, on the, all the doors and windows to help prevent that. And when you look around the room here, you kind of see, um, it looks a lot bigger than what it actually is in person. But we'll come out here into the main room of the, the structure and talk a little bit about that. So everything you see inside this building was here. 
left here in 1943 on the altar stands right here in the corner. This is just one of uh, three separate places that we actually have a uh, altar. And we'll get to uh, the main shrine that's inside the, the general store here shortly. So the main room that you were standing in had two basic purposes. First, during the day, it was Doc Hayes' waiting room. What he would do is have you come and sit on these different stools and chairs and benches around the room, sit there, and then he'd call you over into this big red chair. This was his, his examination chair. He'd have you sit there and he'd put your, you would put your arm out on this little stool. He used to have a little pillow right, right there. He asked you a couple questions, what was wrong with you? He would feel your pulse, known as pulsology. He could, he could distinguish up to 27 different pulses. And a lot of times he was uh, pretty good at knowing what was wrong with you. Once he did that, he take you over here into the apothecary. And we'll head on inside. And he will select some of the 560 ingredients that we have back here. And all these different tins, boxes, and packages still have all these different ingredients inside of them that he would choose from. Some common things that he had which probably would not be common too much today in modern medicine. But uh, he had um, things such as snake alcohol or snake oil. And in this jar right here, you can see what we believe is a rattlesnake and some other snake form here as well. If we spin around to the bench area, you can see some other ingredients that he had out, including the bear paw, deer legs for, with deer tendons, antlers. And what he would do is he would ask you a few questions, um, like I said before, and he would select some of the ingredients. And a lot of times he would make a salve or some kind of poultice, or a lot of times, more commonly, a tea. He would use this coffee grinder over here in the corner to grind up some of these different ingredients or the mortar and pestle over here in the corner. He'd also uh, provide uh, modern day at the time medicines as well. Some of these items that you can still find today, um, some of these prescription medicine bottles, um, like some of the red ones for diarrhea or some kind of intestinal issues that you may be having, uh, things of that sort. And he would, like I said, make a tea, you, and he would hand all these different ingredients. Um, he would used to make them for you. And then at some point he decided, well, I think I'm just gonna give you the ingredients and you can take them home and treat yourself with them, which is a lot of times what he ended up doing. When the first Chinese were here um, prior to 1900, most of, the, most of his patients were Chinese and that is what the majority of his patients were. After 1900, particularly after 1910, um, most of his Chinese patients were pretty much gone. And so on occasion, um, someone who was non-Chinese would come in and need treatment and they would seek out uh, doctors. And a lot of the doctors that were in town were trained in Western medicines at the time. And most of the times they were unable to help or help cure it. In fact, we have one good story to where there was a rancher who had a son who it's some kind of ailment and they said, uh, we need to take him down to the town doctor. Took him to one of the doctors and they said, well, what we would suggest that you do is you take your boy back home, put him in bed, make him as comfortable as you can and start making arrangements for his passing that they expected that would happen within a few days. Well, the rancher did not like that news. So in desperation, he actually came here to Kamwa Chung and visited Doc K. The doc looked at the boy and said, you know what? I think we can actually help treat him. But what I need to have you do is leave the boy here for about three days. You can come on back after three days and we'll see how he's doing. Three days later, the rancher came back, noticed that his son was actually up and walking. He was still very weak. 
but at that point, they knew that the boy would be saved. And at that point, um, that is when Doc Cage's reputation really started taking off. More people would start coming to Doc Cage to be treated for different illnesses. Doc Cage uh, pretty much um, specialized in uh, blood poisonings and, and things of that sort. And so he was able to treat most of that materials and developed a pretty good reputation. Over here in this little room is Doc Cage's bedroom. This is where he spent the next six years of his life in this little room right here. As you can see, it's sparsely decorated, not a lot going on. A couple of things with this, then we can actually head inside here with the virtual reality that we can go into his bedroom and you can kind of notice a few other things and we can get up a little bit closer to unlike you could if you were actually here. You can see that he had incense sticks here on his nightstand. Uh, this clock that's there on the stand um, does not have a glass face to it. And so that is how we feel that he probably was able to tell time by feeling the hand dials because of his blindness. And you can see a cleaver, which I'll talk about here in a moment. And he had some combs, razor blades, and other things on his nightstand here as well. If you notice, this wallpaper looks a little bit newer than the rest of it in the building, because it is. In 2007, we actually had a restoration done with the building, and they used the same print pattern on the wall um, that they found in a Sears Robot catalog, and they were able to reproduce the pattern. And if you look over here on this wall by the door, this is the original paper uh, wallpaper. You can see that the patterns match pretty closely from, from this image. So it's just stepping back out here to the front door. And we'll spin around here to give you another look. A couple of unique things with the with Dot K and his bedroom. If you look under his bed, there is a trunk. In that trunk, they found $23,000 worth of on-cast checks. A lot of people kind of question why he never cast the checks and there was numerous theories about it. However, the main reason is that Doc K, when he, he treated patients, that was his life's calling. And he did not feel he had to be paid for that service. And so he just never cast the checks. And we actually have um, a few people um, who have recently passed away that were treated by Doc Hay, and one of them was a good friend of his, and he asked the doc why one day he never cast the checks, and he says, I didn't need the money. They did. So it's just one of the things about Doc Hay that is kind of a personal touch. And then there's a little story with this little meat cleaver right here. Because of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, a lot of the Chinese around the area were not allowed to own firearms. So um, in this case, they used cleavers. It's something they used every day uh, for about everything. Well, we actually have two separate oral history accounts um, and it relates to uh, two separate occasions where some kids decided to see what was inside Ken Chung building when Doc K was still living here by himself. One night, one story goes, is that some children wanted to heard about all these checks that was underneath his bed. And so they decided, well, maybe we can sneak in one night and see about these checks and maybe we can grab them and see if we can't use the money. So one night they found out that Doc K left the main door open for ventilation, opened up the screen door, took a couple steps in. Next thing they knew, this, uh, the cleaver whizzed by their heads, hit the wall over here, and they bolted out. And they told everyone in town, don't go in the dock as building because they'll throw the meat cleaver at you. So it kind of brings up three separate points with that story. First off, we have a historical account of Doc K using it for defense. Second point is when he was throwing it, he did not know where he was throwing it because he was actually blind from his blindness, which we believe that Doc K um, had poor vision when he first arrived through the John Day, and by 1940, he was almost completely blind. Third point is that when you have stories about uh, K 
kids breaking in the building and having a meat cleaver being thrown at them. And then you have the adult population who knew Langan and Dake and respected them from being members of the community. Probably goes a long ways why this building was never vandalized during that 20 year period. And that is the reason why, in part, why we have everything still intact inside the building today. Coming back out to the main room, I said there was two purposes. After Dake was done for the day, I was doctoring, that is when Mangang would come out, the businessman. Well, he is what we call the China boss. He could speak and write English very fluently, unlike Dake, and he was the go between the Chinese community and the non Chinese. He would help find um, work and housing for all the new immigrants when they first came into town. He would help with legal matters. He would actually help write letters home to other Im Chinese immigrants. Uh, he, he was pretty much the person to go and try to get all this um, item done for all these new immigrants when he first came into town. And when he he was doing all this on lot.k, he liked to have money. And so he charged a fee for everything that he did, including charging a fee um, to tell their people's fortunes. And this altar here is uh, possibly an area where they helped to do that. And I'll just kind of spin around here as I'm talking a bit more about Lung On. And this would be his general store back here that we'll get to in a moment. But as you can see, there's a lot of different uh, calendars scattered on all these walls. And we have near 100 uh, calendars in their collection here. And they date from all anywhere from 1903 up till into the 1940s. And as you can see here, we also have a Patriot poster, which we also have copies of here in the collection here as well. And with Lung An, um, the businessman, he offered a lot of different services. And he and Lung and Doc He um, were very popular with the kids and the women around town. In fact, it's very well known that Doc He and Lung An both would give a Waihee peanut butter kisses and other candy to all the kids and women when they came to visit. And kids um, would also go in pit and go fish and a lot of times we would, they would um, catch like suckers or things of that sort in the creek, come to Dot K, he would pay them 10 cents per fish and he knew he, they would get a piece of candy for their troubles as well. So that's one way that some of the local kids would make a little bit of money out of it. And we'll actually head back here into the general store that uh, Long on ran. And this is another place that uh, we don't allow other people to visit, but we'll head on back in here with this new technology that we got. When the Chinese community was here, uh, the Long on sold a lot more Chinese goods, um, most of it coming from Hong Kong area, you know, coming up to San Francisco, then up the coast to Portland, and then eventually here to John Day. As the Chinese community left, um, Dake Long An had a choice to make. Are we going to stay here or are we going to go someplace else uh, along with our fellow countrymen? Well, they chose to stay here, which we think was not a hard decision for them because they, at that time, they really were um, making a lot of money at that point. And they were starting to be respected in the town in spite of some of the violence and discrimination that was uh, continuing on even after 1900. So after the Chinese left, Long An started selling a lot more Western goods. And today you can still see these, a uh, few of these items. Everything in this general store predates 1941 because that is the last time that Long An ordered any items before his death in December of 1940. And Long An, as far as we can tell, never really did any ordering for the general store after that period. So some of the neat things you see in here are things you still find today, like Lipton's tea, a variety of baking powder and baking soda, 
One Minute Quaker Oats. And yes, we did do some research in the first commercial one minute Quaker Oats was produced in the 1920s. So it actually came out a lot sooner than a lot of people actually think. And you can see they also sold like Vaseline, Polydent, assortment of first aid supplies, even Mac capacitors is still around today. Blue blue tins of aspirin, on facial cream. And so his store actually catered to a lot of uh, different folks here in town. Even sold batteries. And over here on the table, um, you can still see some items uh, related to the Chinese community, such as these brown um, stoneware wide mouth jars. This used in my samples. And over here on this side, you can see a lot of other main items that uh, they would sell, including the two best sellers, which is tobacco and alcohol. So a lot of tobacco products. And they also would play games. Uh, Long Island would not just sell games, but he would also play them. And he would sell a lot of alcohol here as well. That's what a lot of these jars have since evaporated, but some of the jars still have some liquid in them. And over here, we'll actually head back out because there's one good spot. And back in here is also that men and Chime we'll talk about here in a little bit is uh, one of the temples and the shrines. This is the shrine that is in the Camel Chung store. It still has the original fruit that Da K put out there, we think um, shortly before he had to be taken to Portland. You can see all the different incense sticks, uh, fruits, uh, sweet smelling candles, um, parakeet feathers, all this paper and silk tissue and everything is still in here, including those lanterns that are still hanging from the ceiling. And the last one was shipped from Hong Kong in 1915, 1916. Let's take it back out here to the main room. From this vantage point right here, there's one other thing that Long An um, really made a name for himself with, is that when they were doing all these different activities of finding work, finding housing, they'd have all these uh, people come in to the building and so he could help with all these different activities. Sometimes he would even pull this red table out. When he did that, that meant his casino was open for business. They would play cards, mahjong, fantan, dominoes, dice. He even learned to play poker that game. He really started making and losing fortunes. Uh, there's records that he may have been spending as many as maybe a thousand dollars at a time. And because he was a house, he was able to make a lot of money doing that. And so there was a lot of activities going on in this building. Over here, we'll step into the kitchen next. And this is what I like to call the bed and breakfast of Camo Chung. We'll head on over in here. As you can see, this is kind of a typical Pioneer's kitchen. Um, a lot of the things in here, they have the very large wood stove uh, for cooking um, other different foods. Um, some of Dot K's medicines he bought on here as well. There's another shrine here uh, behind the stove to Zhao Shek, the kitchen god. And again, you can see the fruit that's on here, including the pomegranate. Over here, we'll come over here a little bit closer. And you can see some of the other items that he had in here. Um, there is some indication that this little cupboard right here was also kind of like their, uh, like an ice box they were known to put uh, some blocks of ice in here to help keep some of their perishable goods 
from going bad in this little cupboard right here, which is now filled with all these duffer plates and bowls and cups. After the Chinese left, um, Doc Hay and Lang An would uh, provide um, meals for all the new immigrants when the Chinese were here, and then also for the patients that Doc Hay would bring in. Even this uh, Wheaties box right here is unopened. And there is no mice that had chewed through of it. So that is still full of its contents. Up here, you can see peanut butter and jelly. I would not recommend eating any of the peanut butter or jelly today, but it is still there and it is still greasy and oily. And you can see other goods that they had down here that you can see today, such as Del Monte. Um, there's even, um, Worcestershire sauce, and Lee and Perrin's, uh, Wesson oil. And right here is the very large wok that Dake and Lunga would use for the meals for the Chinese immigrants and later on Dake's patients. And then when I said the bed and breakfast, this is really what I did mean because what they would do is Lunga would charge them about for, uh, 20 to 25 cents a meal for a meal. And then if they want lodging, he'd charge an extra five cents. And what he would do is all the Chinese laborers when they would come into town, charge them five cents a night per person, up to four people per bed. Yes, I did say four people per bed. There is some indications that uh, it's, at the Hyatt Chinatown, there have been as many as that many people in here. They could have slept head to toe over the length of the bed. Even you know, whether it's uh, some rubbing here, they may even slept with their feet over the edges of the bed here as well. After the Chinese community left, Doc K started using these bunks for his patients. We have records of patients coming as far as ways Texas and South Dakota to be treated by him. And Lung An took advantage of that as well. He put his own clothing catalog here on the wall so they could see what they wanted to purchase. And if you look, I think over here on this spot, you can get a decent view of it. If you look on the bottom of the bed, there's more pages to the catalog. That way, when you woke up in the morning, you knew what you wanted to buy. And another thing that you can see over here as well is after Lung An passed away in 1940. Some relatives of Doc K by the name of Bob Wah and his family moved in. And you can see, still see some of the writing that one of the kids probably did here on the wall, practicing their skills. And we do not know who Peggy is. Over here on this side of the wall, this is what I kind of like to re refer to as like um, a little stand or desk like you would see in the motel. Um, there's um, different sewing kits and things of that sort that's still here on the shelf, even in the side of the drawers. And there's a couple other things to point out here as well. There's a picture of a child right here. We have no information on that at all. The only clue is, is that there is a red star above him and the clothing appears to date back to the 19 teens, roughly about the World War I era, we think. Um, but we have no idea who it is or what the relationship is. If you notice right here, this is a kind of a postcard size of famous oil painting, uh, the Three Sisters of the Temperance Movement. And I actually cleaned off a corner of the painting so you can see exactly how much soot and smoke there is on that because all this dark stain that you see on the walls and ceilings is not paint or stain it's actually smoke from decades of wood fire smoke uh, kerosene oil lamps opium smoking and tobacco smoking probably the one of the most significant things we have here in Kenwa Chung is this photograph right here I gotta step back a little bit to kind of give you a backstory. In the 1930s, when the Great Depression hit, um, John Day had basically two different 
um, banks and one of them closed and one of them was the Grant County National Bank or Grant County Bank. And a rancher by the name of Herman Oliver um, and Long On and Doc Hay got together and said, you know what? We are not gonna pull the money out of the bank. We're gonna keep it in there to keep it open. Well, we always thought that Long On um, got this um, picture um, because of the amount of business that he was doing with the bank. This is the first National Bank of Portland. The building is still there. And it basically says to Long On, a John Day, Oregon, a staunch friend and local supporter. Well, like I said, we thought it was because of Miles' business that he was doing with the bank. By that time, he had six different banks, numerous bank accounts among them. And we always thought that was the case. Well, about, I guess going on three years ago now, I was scanning the last of the documents and I came across a letter from this bank president. In that letter, he said, Long on, I wish to thank you for loaning us the money to keep the bank open. To us, that is a big deal. First off, you don't get very many individuals um, loaning money to a bank to keep them open. And it's even more important because this was a Chinese citizen who was not a citizen doing these activities. This is just one of the many examples that we have here at Kemal Chung that we are finding that uh, even though there was some violence and discrimination against the Chinese, it was not not as prevalent here in John Day as in other areas, mainly because we think that the Long Island and Doc Hay with their involvement with the community pretty much made a home for themselves. And there really wasn't as bad for them and other Chinese in their area because of that relationship. And this kind of picture is, to me is kind of a capstone for the whole collection that we got. And then the letter goes on to say that if Doc Hay or Long Island was to ever visit Portland to let him know, he would send them up in the best seat in town for the rest of their lives. And so this is pretty much the bed and breakfast, the kitchen and bunk area of the Kamwa Chung. Over in this area that we'll head into next is Long An's bedroom. This room was added on about 1940, uh, excuse me, about 1914. And the reason why we think that is because that lot, Doc K was tired of Doc K going in and out of the main and only entry to the building at that time. And because Long An, not only was he running the general store and doing his casino business from here, but he also had other businesses. He was co-owner and founder of other companies in Oregon, including John Day, Baker City. He also had land and mining claims throughout Oregon and Washington. We even recently found out he owned a, port, uh, a warehouse in Portland. That, so that may be how he was able to transport goods over here to John Day. And this room was found um, pretty much with extensive water damage in 1968 when they first opened it up. You can still see some water damage that we still get to today. So everything in this room has been reconstructed. The only thing that's still originals are the doors, the windows, and the knob and tube wiring that we are still using today. First electric bill was in 1902 but we are still able to use the existing wiring. But not to fear, the wiring is not on a high voltage system. We only use a 12 volt power system for all these lights. So you may wonder like, well, what happened if this is Doc K's bedroom, then where's the bed? This comes back into play of the Wah family. When the Wah family first arrived here after Long An passed away, Doc K needed some help. And so a nephew of his by the name of Bob Bob comes in the picture, moved into the building with his family, and they stayed in the building for probably a couple of years before moving across the parking lot into another house that Doc Hay actually built for them. And so when they moved out, they took all the Long Island belongings and furnishings with him as with them as well. So there's not a lot left of Long On in here in this room. Just a couple more points to point out is that behind this red door 
is our fire and alarm suppression system. If you ever come on a regular tour, we'll show you that. But in there, it holds our $2 million fire suppression system. Um, it uses no power. It works to put out fires underneath benches, stools, even in the walls and ceilings. And what it does, it causes a lot less damage because any fire that might break out, um, the system activates and it super humidifies the air with a nitrogen compression tank system that super pressurizes the water in a holding tank that makes it super humid. So it kind of smothers the fire out. One other thing I'll point out here to you, we'll head back outside is if you notice, there is a second floor to the building. This was added on around the 1890s, corresponding to the completion of the, of the Prairie City to Baker City Railroad. Everyone thought there was gonna be a big mining boom, including Lagan. he wanted to add more bunk space. So he went around town, found the house, hoisted it up on top, and that's what became the second floor. He never did use it for lodging, but this is a place where he stored most of the documents. In fact, in our collection, we have about 20,000 documents in our archives. Uh, about 6,000 of them are in historic Cantonese Chinese. And this is where most of them were found up in the attic or the second floor up there. Of those 6,000, we have about 2,000 that are Chinese medical formulas that Dot K put together. Um, dating all the way up until almost to the time of his departing in 1948. We have professors here about three or four years ago and they looked at this collection and they came back to us and said, we just wanna let you know of all the places in the world, you have the largest in cat intact collection of Chinese medical um, medicine and herbal documents they have ever seen in one place. And it's very important to them and there is continuing researchers. In fact, um, we had a researcher here not too long ago that found a formula from Dot K that was the base formula for the flu, which he modified in 1918, 1919 for the Spanish flu. And the professor released an article here um, back in December 2020 saying that this same formula is very likely usable to combat the COVID virus here as well. So there's a little bit of tie with everything with Kim Kim Chung as far as the med medical records and documents that we have here as well. So the archives is actually housed in our correction facility over behind the interpreter center here in John Day in the holds. And we are coming to realize through all the researchers and experts that not only is this the large and syntax Chinese medical traditional medicine uh, site, but it's also one of the few places in the world that has a collection like this. The only other places in the world is in New Zealand and in London. So we're only one of three places that has a collection intact as it is today. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation and pass it on over to Ben and Chai Mei. Thank you so much, Don. I will put you off the spotlight and put Bennett and Choi Mei on. Bennett, I would also encourage you to check out the Q&A. There are a lot of questions there for you if you have a moment to answer them. Sure. All right, Bennett and Choi May, I believe we'll need you to, yep, I think you're unmuted now and I'll share your screen. Okay. And folks bear with us as uh, I am advancing the slides and I'll try to keep up with Bennett and Choi May as we go. Okay, well, I'll start off. Um, this is Choi May, we'll do, do some of the talking. I'll do some of the talking. And um, this is, um, we're talking also about Kam Wa Chung, but from the point of view of what it tells us about early Chinese religion in John Day and the Pacific Northwest. Next slide. Next slide. 
Hey, next. We'll be talking about three different subjects here, about the a little bit more about the more general background about Chinese and John Day. We'll talk about early Chinese religious practices in America, and we'll talk about what they were actually doing in John Day. Next. Um, we'll skip over most of this. This is just statistics. Um, it's important to realize that John Day, although it may be not a big central place in Oregon today. It was very important in its day and Grant County was very important. As it says here, by 1970, Grant County had more Chinese than any other county in the entire region, many more than in Portland, in fact, and that um, it was a rich place um, of considerable political importance as well as um, economic importance. And this is one of the reasons why it attracted a lot of Chinese immigrants. Next slide. As it says here, one of the most important Chinese stores in the whole region was Kamwa Chan. And it was actually one of the most important stores in the entire area in the late 1870s. That's one of the reasons why a couple of um, relatively wealthy newcomers, Ying Da He and Lung An, bought the store. Next slide. Here they are, you've already seen the pictures, you've already seen the pictures of the, um, of the building itself. Next slide. And there were a bunch of partners, a bunch of other Chinese were somehow involved financially with the new store as after it was founded, after it was set up by Lung An and by, uh, by Doc A. Um, these guys we know very little about, but they, they did exist and they were partners in the store. Next slide. I want to add that these are uh, uh, images that we took from NARA, that is the National Archives and the Records Administration. And uh, we are thankful that uh, such records exist. It's extraordinary to have these pictures of so many people um, who were there in the Kamwa Chang or in John Day or in the area in those days. Next slide. But one interesting thing now is Kamwa Chung was, and Don, you may not realize this either, it was not all by itself. There were actually rivals, including this, this one here, the Kuang Yun Lung store, um, also, in, also in John Day. We know where it was located. And here is an advertisement, which we think is certainly one of the finest advertising jingles uh, written by any Chinese, uh, for any Chinese um, business in the whole of America. It reads, let me read it to you, Wa Mi and Ak Atong and Atoy announced to the public with exceeding joy, we bought the store and all the tea formerly owned by Mr. Bangui. In buying thus, we bought no debt nor any ills that debt begets, but guarantee by dealing fair the local trade to ever share. If then you wish to trade at all, give us forthwith an early call. And if our name you wish to know, we print it plain just here below. Kuang Yun Lung Ko. As I say, it's a wonderful poem. And actually it's a thing which um, Kam Wa Chung store probably could not match. And Aho, the first one, is actually the, the smaller portrait. That is Aho. One of the owners. Yeah. Next slide. And these are typical customers that were miners. There were other um, Chinese who were not miners in the John Day area. A very famous one was a Chinese cowboy named Buckaroo Sam. And Buckaroo Sam is the subject actually of a forthcoming uh, comic strip article, which will be appearing in the, in the uh, Oregon Historical Quarterly published by the Oregon Historical Society. And soon you'll be able to learn more if you read that journal from the Historical Society about Buckaroo Sam. But there were a very lot of these Chinese there, including, of course, um, Lung An, one of the most uh, one of the most enterprising and complicated um, Chinese citizens of the entire region. Next slide. And then the reason that we want to include all these portraits and uh, individuals is that uh, for a temple to exist, it has to be supported by many people other than Lung An and uh, and, and Dok He. So these people that we show you are probably uh, patrons of any temples in John Day at the time. 
Okay, it's my part, and I'm going to talk in general that the Chinese religion in America before 1920, and uh, the um, the deity that now we know today that is in the uh, Kamachung uh, shrine that Don just showed you is a deity. The name is called Sui Jing Bo. Now, Sui Jing Bo is a Taoist, a Taoist deity, and you know that uh, most popular uh, uh, religions in China is Taoism and Buddhism. Taoism was the dominant uh, 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 trend of religion among the Chinese in America in those days. And most of the Chan or Gihao Uktin associations would have enshrined Sui Jingbo. That is because Sui Jingbo was one of a, a Chan clan members. But there are places that Sui Jingbo was enshrined, not particularly because the worshippers were Chans. And these are the four or five that we identify in the, in the West Coast. And those are the, uh, port, the one in Portland, the one in Oroville, but John Day and Boise are the two very outstanding ones. But why did they worship him if they were not named Chan? Well, we'll we'll tell you in, in a in a in a minute because Sui Jingbo was being seen as the deity that would keep epidemic at bay and any kind of uh, 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 health problems. And Lei Hua the the god of medicine, he was able to clean up things in the, in in a community. A very useful deity nowadays. <laughs> we should we, we should have him now. Next one, please. Well, in year two, uh, 2010, that was our first time visiting Kamachong, and the curator then was Christine, uh, Chris, Christine Sweet. And um, in the middle of uh, walking into the storeroom, and she says, oh, I have a big board with some Chinese characters. Would you like to see it? And there she is pulling the board to show us. Next slide, please. And when she flipped it over, we almost fell off from our seat because what it is, is the name Sui Jing Bo. And it is a temple, a temple sign to be uh, used mostly uh, at the top of the entrance of a temple. And in John Day, in those days, I totally was not prepared to see a Sui Jing Bo signboard in John Day at all. Next slide, please. And Christina will share our excitement. So uh, right away, she put the board uh, in the interpreted center. If you go there today, you can still see it. It's still being kept there. And along with the board that is on the kind of top of that case that you're seeing, the light color one. And together with that board, he also, uh, she also included a couple of uh, temple couplets and, uh, and an altar cloth, the red one, uh, which is all related to temples. And he also, she also explained uh, what uh, Sui Jingbo did uh, in general. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, let's take a look at uh, what, uh, going back, please go back to Boise, thank you. Uh, going back, we, we also want to see what happened in, uh, in Boise, uh, since we say that is another place that Sui Jingbo should not have been expected, but it was there. In Boise, you know, we actually think that around 1900, there was a temple. It might have been built a little earlier, but in 1900, it was definitely there, a very humble little place. And with the signboard, uh, Sui Jingbo Temple on top of the entrance, it isn't the same board as the one that we saw at, uh, at John Day because the Boise one has four characters. It says Sui Jingbo Temple and the one in John Day is a Sui Jingbo. And that uh, the larger picture is the interior of the Sui Jingbo. And here you see the standard shrine of um, a temple that right in the middle is the altar piece and in front of it is the altar with all kinds of objects on top of it. And uh, on both sides are decorative uh, things like uh, banners and umbrellas. And none of these exist anymore now in Boise, but it's, uh, it's wonderful that we have these pictures. Next slide, please. Next slide. And I want to take you to Portland a little bit, even though Portland, the, today the Sui Jingbo um, shrine actually is within the Gihao Oktin Association and one of the clan members of the Gihao Oktin is Chen, and that is very logical to have a Sui Jingbo there. But what is 
unusual, unusual, and I don't have an answer for that, is that they actually uh, have a bell with the name Sui Jingbo Temple on it. Yet, this bell uh, was made in 1888, 1888, the same year that uh, John Day uh, uh, Long An moved into Ken uh, uh, Chung. And uh, uh, the, but yet the Gihau Okjian Association was established in 1904. That is the large white building uh, in the picture. And right next to it is the red building of, um, of uh, Bingong. And you could mention, Chui Mei, that the Giha Okjin has one of the finest Chinese shrines, or group of Chinese shrines, still in existence anywhere in Oregon, maybe the best. That's absolutely true. And absolutely. Um, this is a great, a very important historical treasure now. <laughs> and the not very historical treasure is the new noodle shop, the one red underneath the red building. That is the best roast up noodle shop that uh, I know in America. Wonderful. Next slide, please. And here we are going into the Yihao Okdin Association and they have two shrines and this is one of them. And again, you see the same uh, format of, uh, of a temple uh, arrangement, a big, very uh, ornate carving altarpiece. And in front of it is an altar table with an assortment of things. And in the niche of that altarpiece, you're looking at a statue of Sui Jingbo with a picture, a, a drawing of Sui Jingbo. Of course, the drawing is a, is a, is a creative work, not, not really historical. Plus self row uh, spirit tablets, you know, those kind of uh, curvy things and a lot of gold, a lot of red. And each tablet will have the name of the deities that they, they, they enshrine there. Next slide, please. And I want to sh also show you the one in Oroville. The Oroville one, uh, it's uh, only a smaller temple of a larger compound. And as you, uh, you see the picture at the lower uh, left-hand end, the very, very last room is a Sui Jingbo temple. Today, they claim it as a Chen Association temple, but it did not start it that way. It was a Sui Jingbo temple to begin with. And inside the temple today, they use same, the same uh, 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 configuration and altarpiece. In the middle is the Sui Jingbo statue and then the altar table plus a very large flag with the name Sui Jingbo in it. And I want to mention that this temple actually was in existence in 1874. And for those who are familiar with Oroville uh, in California, they would know that in 1874, there was a major uh, epidemic among the Chinese miners. So is it a coincidence or not? I don't know, but that's something to remember. Next slide, please. And let's take a look at Weaver Wheel, a famous temple. If you haven't seen it, you have to see it. This is one of the most important Chinese heritage in America. And inside the temple, uh, there are multiple shrines. And one of the smaller shrines actually uh, has these three statues. The one in the middle is Sui Jingbo. It wasn't called Sui Jingbo Temple or anything, but it was Sui Jingbo uh, statue. And again, you know, this is a situation that it's not exclusively Chen, but Sui Jingbo was there. And so uh, even though he was right next to Wat Ho, you know, the, the god of medicine, so it seems that there are multiple effort to uh, include deities that will protect their health. Next slide, please. Oh, wait, and you can add, Chue Mei, mm -hmm. that Weaverville is, is close to the Oregon border, as many of you know, if you haven't gone down and visited it. And, was, and the Chinese of Weaverville were in very close contact with the Chinese of Jackson in, uh, in Southern Oregon. And these were both big gold mining centers. The guys who built this were gold miners. You're right, you're right. I, <laughs> okay, next slide, please. All right, so Ben, it's your take now. Okay, well, this is, um, uh, we've already heard, which is summarizing what, John, what Don was telling us. Before 1900, well before 1900, we know from um, surviving writings by, by Doc Hay, in fact, that there was a small temple for three deities um, somewhere in town. But around 1900, a, a bigger, or presumably bigger and undoubtedly better temple was built in town. Um, Don has shown us the location. A few temple objects seem to have survived from it. 
but this was a temple dedicated specifically to Suijing, Suijing Bo, and there must have been a few other deities in the temple as well, as was very common in any Taoist temple. And finally, after that, the last, uh, only a small shrine to Suijing Bo um, appeared at the Kamwa Chung store. This was partly due to um, Doc Hay's own personal interest. And it may be that a um, medical connections of, of Suijing, uh, Suijing Bo may have appealed to Doc Hay who after all was in the business. And I want to add that though, we are able to reconstruct this sequence. It's, it's just because of the excellent uh, archival collection. There are so many letters and, uh, and, and different kinds of writings that will allow us to read into the sequence of their way of building temples. So it, there's nowhere else that we can find information like this. So this is tremendous. Yeah, the archival collection of tremendous importance. We just underlined what Don was telling you, that this is one of the best um, Chinese archives of its kind anywhere, and certainly is unequaled anywhere in the United States in terms of continuity and size and general importance. It's entirely, uh, all the Chinese parts of it are only now beginning to be put into order but the curators there are doing an excellent job. Next slide. Also in 1900, John Day had a Chinese priest. This gives us some idea about the original temple. Um, we don't know much else about that priest, but he wasn't living in the store. But on the other hand, he had a, may have had a house, which may have been the temple itself. Next slide. And here is a picture of the shrine. Shrine may take us through this if you could now. Okay, we, we are very familiar with these two uh, images now. Then here is a Christina again. And then you are looking at the entrance into the interior of the, uh, of the, the room where a lot of stock being kind of uh, kept. And then the little, little shrine is, uh, is, is in the middle of those shelves. And the, one, the picture on the, on the left-hand side shows the, the small shrine that we are looking at. Okay, next slide, please. Well, in year 2017, that was the year for me is a kind of breakthrough with the hell of Dawn. Dawn was eager to find out more about the shrine and so did we. So we decided to take a closer look at this shrine. Now, before we dismantle it, we, I want you to, to, to take a look at it. The shrine actually is a big box uh, with the red ribbon surrounding it and that is the, the, the size of the big shrine. But within it is a kind of strange, there's a smaller box with the two pominos sitting on top of it. I don't know whether you can see the two pomino in a smaller shrine. Now, and then you can also see that a lot of those green dots, you know, those are um, uh, pe peacock feather. And the Chinese use those to, um, to add onto a deity. And usually they will put two for one deity. And how many green dots you can see? I can see at least eight of them. So does it mean that the shrine actually has more than one deity enshrined in it? And then remember at this point, we actually do not know, we, we did not know who the deities were. And Don is going to help us. Next slide, please. And so we focus on the small box at the bottom of it, you know, with the uh, you can see that the two pomino are still still there. And Don removed some of those uh, incense burners. And what we can see is two pieces of paper. One, I totally cannot read because of the light and because of the angle. And then another sign where you can see actually two uh, larger Chinese character in black. And then I can read. And that is surprisingly not an image not a spirit uh, uh, tablet, not a particular name, except that it is a promissory note saying that they will promise Sui Jing Bo an opera show or something. This is so unusual. I've never seen it anywhere in any temple in my life. And I have seen them a lot, I have to tell you. So this is unusual. Next one, please. Okay, Ben, why don't you talk well, about- Well, the question it? is, who was it was, was put that, who made that promise? Um, was it Lunga? Not, not, not likely. 
Um, there are many, there are records, Chinese language records of donors for religious activities in John Day. Um, Lunan is not mentioned in it. We know, as Don told us, he was a successful businessman. He was also the leading car dealer in Eastern Oregon at the time, but he did not spend a whole lot of time praying. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Quite different. Doc Hay was a very religious man. And um, one of the things, he too was interested in business, um, but he did consult the gods, um, but not his own gods. Interestingly, he got, in this case, um, somebody else to do this for him, to um, consult the gods, ask for fortune, and got fortune tickets. Um, and John, Don, Doc Hay was asking, is it all right to invest in a mine? Yeah, okay, maybe okay. Was it all right to close a deal in Pendleton? We don't know what the deal was. And he got an absolutely flat no from the dad. He said, it's not a good idea. Now, why did he, why, why did he, couldn't Doc Hay interpret the ticket, tickets himself and do it himself? Oh, we don't know. Next slide, please. But he was interested in other temples. He was interested because this is part of what is sometimes not really properly understood by outsiders. The Chinese had a communication network that was quite efficient, and they were close, in very close contact with Chinese and often non-Chinese in other parts of the, of the Western United States, certainly well beyond Eastern Oregon. And in this case, um, Doc Hay kept Kam Wachung, religiously speaking anyway, in close connection with people in other parts of the region. Next slide, please. Chinese in the neighborhood sent for requests for fortune tickets um, into Doc A. Next slide, please. And um, this is coming back now to the, one of these papers that was pasted, posted at the back of the shrine. Um, this is now a, ch a charm, a, um, a, a good luck charm. But this one um, came from a temple in Baker City. And we know there was quite an important Chinese temple in Baker City, now all gone now, and a few things still survive from it. <clears throat> this is um, what we can read, and it says, protection for, by the gods, certainly a desirable thing. Next slide, please. So maybe I can add to that. Next slide. So, okay, so in, uh, in Kim Ha Chong, and there are actually three uh, charms of that kind issued by the Baker City's temple. One of them is, now, you remember this is the entrance to the inner shrine and between the clock where the white arrow is and then the, the frame. And there is a, a next slide and we can see better. There is, there's the same charm, you know, the red, the red piece of paper. So it was there. And again, you know, it sounds like switching ball needs the blessing from another temple. Another, uh, another slide, please. And the third copy is, you actually have seen it. Don has already shown it. Next slide. This is a very unusual place to have a shrine, but nonetheless, one of the Baker City in the Singong uh, red paper is paste on top of it, but not right in the middle. There's something else that has been removed on the left-hand side. Next slide, please. Ben, and just it? another more evidence of, of connection between um, between John Day and Baker City. Um, each of them had a temple hanging. The temple hangings were donated or very similar, maybe made in the same place, but were donated by the same guy and presumably at about the same time. He donated one to the, to, to the temple in Baker City and one to the temple in John Day. And here's the pair of them. As I say, there were close religious connections there. Next slide, please. And so this is sort of what we know, um, a very brief summary about the religious side of what we know about them, but they're about Doc Hay and Lung An and about Kam Wa Chan. But it's very important that this is, they have, their significance goes way beyond John Day and tells us a lot about the history, which we did not know before, of early Chinese in the entire Pacific Northwest. Well, I think that is just about it. You know, they never returned to China, even they could, and they never built up a very <clears throat> close relationship with their families in China. And yet they were very, uh, very successful immigrants in John Day. 
And because of the documents and the objects left behind, we're able to see into the minds of them a lot better than in most other cities. So that's it. Okay, and I think, um, well, that's about it. So we have time for a question or two, I think. But as it says here, when Don and his coworkers finish, they're finding things all the time. So keep watching. We'll be able to, they will be able to tell you more. Maybe they'll share the information with us. Thanks. Thank Great. you so much. I, um, give me just one second, Jackie, and I'll make sure to spotlight mm -hmm. you here. Okay. Great. Should we look at the Q&A now? Wait, 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 no, no. Wait, wait. Wait. Jack, I'll need you to start your video. Okay. Um, all right, before we go to the Q&A, I just want to not only thank our presenters, both all three of you, uh, but also to say that, um, as you know, this, this series is really designed to try to develop a fuller picture and to kind of begin to spotlight some of the areas in this broad history that is just in its infancy, it seems to me, uh, of, of Chinese Americans, the development of Chinese Americans in the Pacific Northwest, and particularly in Oregon. And I think what you both have done today is to really take us a huge step forward. I think, I think not only the identification of this archive and what it can teach us, uh, on a number of subjects, I mean, is, is, is really, really important. But moreover, between the portrait of, of Long An as a very sophisticated and wealthy businessman, I mean, the merchant figure in all of these Chinatowns, whether they are towns of 100 people, you know, or 10,000, uh, is really been overlooked, it seems to be, or at least sidelined as we've looked so closely at miners and, 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 and Chinese workers. But clearly, they, along with the professional class and particularly doctors, you know, is a subject that, that, that needs far more attention and comparison across the state. And so I'm just wondering if, if any of you want to comment a little bit further about the significance of, of what you think you're, you're, you have in your grasp here uh, for a, a deeper understanding of, and perhaps revisionist perspective on the importance of, of the Chinese and, and in, in Oregon's early history. Well, one interesting aspect, which Don didn't mention about Chinese doctors, about Da Ke, and there were a number of other well-known doctors, in the Pacific, Chinese doctors in the Pacific Northwest. Right. Why, back in the days, acute racial prejudice, um, did people go around to Chinese doctors, especially women? Why right, exactly. women went to Chinese doctors? Why did they Portland do that? Portland too. Portland too. Yeah. And it turns out that one of the main reasons, and it's been speculated, that Chinese doctors were far more gentle than their white counterparts. Male doctors were not nice people to go to in many cases if you were a modest right. woman, but um, Chinese doctors were far better at handling, so had a much better bedside manner when dealing with, Chinese, with, with female patients. Well, alternate medicine happened a long time ago. <laughs> right. Don? Well, that, that's the thing, and with our uh, with the collections that we got here and the professors that have come over, um, that that's what Ben and Che May has have stated is, is pretty much what we're finding here as well. Um, there, the most of the patients of Dot K's were were female. There were a few men, but not many. And we have letters um, to where they're talking about you're you're such great. We even have letters where patients that went to Western doctors and, the, and they came back to Doc K and we and the Western doctors were furious about that and they were trying to get a court injunction against Doc K for practicing medicine without a license. And that happened at least three times and all three times it basically says, well, Doc K is our town doctor, leave him alone. He's very popular, he's very good. And we have letters um, for those Kate courses where we trust Doc K much more than we trust any Western doctor because they want to cut things off and they are willing to let us die. Doc K is at least trying to heal us. And that is where a lot of that aspect is coming on, on that, that 
on that guard, regard. Right, and, and this is an early expression, you know, of what will become today. I mean, I think an acknowledgement of the importance uh, of, of Chinese and, and Asian medicine generally, and what Western medicine, now that it's had more sophisticated, certainly, and more gentle and more humane, it was barbaric in the late 19th century, still, in comparison to Dante's and other people's. But I wanted this one little point I would like to make before we go to the Q&A. You may or may not know, probably Bennett and, and Troy may know this, that, that when the CCBA was created uh, uh, in, Chicago, in, in Portland, and the fundraising effort was a statewide effort uh, among the Chinese community, that one of the things being considered was a hospital on the fourth floor. And there were some members of the Chinese community who were who were Chinese medicine doctors, but there were a couple of others who were learning Western medicine. And what they were proposing was a, was a hospital that would combine or would benefit from the combined knowledge of both Chinese and Western medicine. It never got off the ground, uh, but I just think that's, that's really, really interesting. And I think perhaps as we begin to develop, and you develop these, these, these whole pieces more thoroughly, it's just a very, very exciting moment, it seems to me. And thank you so much for your contributions. I think we should let the audience can I can I add a little bit to that point, Jackie? I think that's really good that you remind us of the uh, institutions trying to build hospitals. And before that concept became popular, Jaws House was the place for for you know yeah, hospital. Jaws House yeah, Jaws House is the temple, <laughs> and yet at the same time they provide healthcare and it act they acted as a, a, a hospital and hospice. And they even took care of burial uh, uh, business as well. So yeah. Joe's house is not just about worshiping right. or right. temple. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm done. Uh, let's turn this over to the audience. Tracy? Sure, we, we just have a few minutes for some Q&A, uh, but I believe this one is for Ben and Choi Mei from Barbara Milliken. Uh, she would like to know what is a charm paper exactly? Okay, that is just a generic term without going into great detail. And that is a kind of piece of paper, like half the size of an A4 paper. And when you go to a temple, you want to go home to bring some good luck back home. So the temple would uh, print those charm paper for uh, patrons to go home and paste it onto wherever they, they think is fit. And it's also a way that the temple could make some, some money out of it. And, so they uh, charge for the for they the charge oh. for it. And uh, in, in some places in California, we actually even have the blocks of those charm paper. And the good thing about those charm, the particular ones that we saw at John Day, it actually tells you that it's from Baker City, it's from Lisingong, the name of the temple. So it helps us a lot. Thank you. We won't be able to get to all of the questions just because we're kind of running out of time. But one question that is very interesting is, uh, you know, we've heard these wonderful stories of uh, the Kamwa Chang and, and the relationships of the Chinese with uh, the town. Uh, are there any oral histories from other people that can add context to the relationships of uh, Doc He uh, with the, the townspeople? And this is from Bernadette Janet. Um, well, we'd love to know, but Don probably does know. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, we have um, a collection of oral histories that we have done. Uh, anyone back in 2006, primarily, we went around uh, to places around the town, uh, talked with, with residents here about any knowledge, and we have a few people. Um, but most of them are really more back to Doc Hay and their patients as being young kids. There's very few people that would have remembered beyond age five or six at that time. So there's not a lot going on. More people remember Bob Wah and his doctrine. They kind of know about Doc Hay. Um, but at this point, most of the people that knew Doc Hay long on have long since passed away, most of them. Um, but there's a few that still pop up but nothing that we can actually glean about how, what the relationships are through that. Thanks, Don. And this will be the last question. Can you speak on the Chinese pioneers who attended Seventh-day Adventist studies? And this is a question from Dale Hong. Hmm. Gosh. Come on, Don. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
I don't know. No. Ask him the question again. Can you speak on Chinese, pion pi Chinese pioneers who may have attended Seventh-day Adventist studies? Um, we do know, not necessarily in our collection that we have any record of it, but I do know through other work with the uh, Chinese archaeologists that they, they have had some of those. And there's mainly, you'll find those records mainly in Salt Lake at the uh, LDS church down there. Um, but there are a few of them. I know our gene, gene, genealogy society here in John Day is also has more of that information. So if you want to contact me, I can contact them for more information. Thanks, Don. And sorry, one, one last question is, are there any potential threats to John that. Day? Other than that, I Oh, my apologies. I think that our audio might be a little bit choppy. Uh, are there any threats to John Day and the Kamwa Chung given the recent fires? I think the threat is probably the same as to many other um, surviving Chinese structures and Chinese collections in the Western United States um, that they might, the fund, fund, funding might dry up. This is in fact a real threat to the great um, Chinese um, temple and collection in Weaverville in Northern California. It too belongs to a state park system and the state park system keeps threatening that maybe, well, maybe they just can close it down. They'll move the collections to a nice warehouse in Sacramento and maybe someday they'll bring them out again. But this of course is a terrible, a very serious threat. And unfortunately right now it looks as though in Oregon that the state of Oregon is well committed. They understand the importance of the temple, but this is a major threat. And then of course, things like forest fires and so forth are great threats as well. And to add to that, um, one of the biggest threats that last couple of years, like we had that fire that happened in the uh, Museum of Chinese in America in New York that uh, some of their collections got lost. There was another museum in Nevada that uh, lost some of their Chinese records there as well. And so, yeah, we're fastly becoming one of the few places that has a Chinese collection like this. Uh, fortunately, with, with us, we are on the move to get a new interpreter center built here within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. and it's going to be a state-of-the-art curation facility, and it's going to be a lot more protected, at least for the collection and the archive. And like I said, the building itself, Kenwood Chum Building, is under, um, does have a lot of uh, fire protection systems. So we're not too worried about that, but it's, it is always a concern. And this is wonderful. And it is wonderful. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bennett, Chui Mei, Don, and Jackie for thank your you. presentation today. Well, thank I just you. wanted to close with, uh, if you enjoyed today's program, please stay tuned for the seventh program in the Hidden History series. This features the history of the Dowell's Chinatown. And this will be presented by Jacqueline Chung and Eric Gleason on Saturday morning, September 11th. And you can check out our website at www.portlandchinatown.org in the coming weeks for more information and to register. Of course, we, we thank everyone for being friends of the museum. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been fun. Thank you. Bye, everybody.